Hello everybody. I understand that I'm between everybody and beers, so I will, <laughs> I will try to wrap it up as fast as I can. Um, so, hi, duh, down, up, there you go. Um, I'm Shrey, this is sort of my like errata of like who am I and where I've been. Um, as, as said, part of the reason I'm here is because I worked on the USA Ross course, um, proposing, writing, designing it, etc. for I think two-ish two years. Um, and at some point along the journey, I sort of got a lot of imposter syndrome and I was like, Damn, these these kids are gonna be like, oh, so how do you know Rust? I was like, well, I, I sort of just messed around in it, um, and like, oh, so why should you teach us? I'm like, well, it's a good question. So I set up on a mission, and I was like, I want to contribute to the Rust compiler, um, but I had no idea where to start, and so I ended up doing it. Ended up merging a PR with some diagnostic improvements um, for a specific, very specific case, um, and we're gonna walk through the sort of journey, what that looked like for me, and also how you can also do that as well. Um, and it's a lot less complicated than you think. I was sort of like, oh my god, there's like so many issues and there's like all these weird, weird other crates and uh, do I need to know how the borrow checker works internally? Do I need to know how parsers work and compilers work? I don't know any of this stuff, right? I just know a little bit of Rust. Um, but that's all you need. Um, so first step, find an issue. <laughs> um, this is arguably the hardest part because for me, there's a lot of issues that I had no idea what they were even talking about. Like what is like uh, this thing called chalk, which is like the type resolution system behind Rust. I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, I'm going to ignore those labels. What labels do I know about? Oh, I know diagnostics. I know diagnostics. I run into a lot of errors. I write a lot of code that doesn't work. So I can work on errors. Um, and particularly because I do a lot of teaching, I really, really, really am interested in the Rust language philosophy of writing better error messages. And so I came across this this issue. Um, and for those online, and it's an image, it's not old text, apologies, but the image is basically a screenshot of an issue where if you put the generic parameters of a function or a struct or a type or whatever in the wrong spot, the error message doesn't tell you about it. It just says, hey, I expected an identifier, you give me an angle bracket, right? Which is like not very helpful if you're very, very, very new to Rust and you're, you haven't done generics before, you don't know where it should go, etc. So the mission was, okay, well, let's take this and add a little text saying, hey, if these generics are correct, maybe move them to the right spot. Right? And let's add a suggestion that you can just fix it automatically. And in theory, that should be pretty simple, right? Um, this took me like four months to complete. <laughs> Part of that was because I was on holidays while, while doing it, but it was also really fun. So let's go, let's go through it. Uh, wrong way. First part of any, ch any code change, figure out where you're taking the code. So I was like, oh yeah, cool. I'll just do some searches, you know, control F. Rip grep, if you've used rip grep before, rip grep is an amazing like uh, regex sort of finder. Um, amazing. I was like, oh. Oops, yeah, find what does this part, right? Because this is the initial error that happens, right? The original error says expected identifier, found, blah. So I've got to find where on earth in the compiler this comes from, right? Good starting point, find where it comes from, and change it. Um, and, ah, crap, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of lines of code. Ironically, though, this, actually, this screenshot is wrong. Um, I took the screenshot a long time ago. The compiler source code lives in compiler slash blah, not source slash blah. I don't even know what's in source slash blah. I did this last night and I realized this morning it's wrong. There's probably a lot more in compiler. Um, but same same point still stays is that there's a lot of code in the Rust <laughs> in Rust C, uh, which so I was like, hmm, ripgrep is not gonna help, help, uh, help me very much. So I turned to my trusty, uh, you know, very, very advanced debugging tools. Um, and there's a little, little flag you can use in, in Rust C, which is, dash z, treat error as bug. Now, when you have a bug, it will produce a traceback. Tracebacks tell us where from the compiler this thing was emitted. I'm like, great, that will help. Um, and on the left here, you see Rust C plus stage one. Um, the compiler, as I understand it, is executed in stages because I'm only executing sort of the parsing, right? Because we saw before, if I go up, um, it's failing to parse this line, right? I'm not going all the way down to the type checking. I'm going at the very, very top, which is the first sort of stage. Um, so I'm telling Rust to only run that stage. And this whole documentation of how do I set up the Rust compiler to do this, there's a whole book called the Rust C Dev Guide. I read like two chapters and it told me how to do that. I was like, great, we'll do that. Um, so I did this thing. Yep, the arrow. And I got this big panic message with a lovely traceback. There's a lot of garbage here. Um, and I, I looked for something that was sort of useful. And I was like, oh, look, new parser from file. That sounds like a good starting point. So I went in the code base um, using my trusty LSP, and I found this use uh, new parser from file ended up just being a wrapper for parse create mod function, and this looked again pretty useless except they had one function. So I was like, okay, let's just go down. Um, in this parse mod, 
uh, function, it's as you expect, it parses a module. It takes a module of code of some sort and it tries to parse every single thing in that module. At some point, there was a function there called parse ident. And I was like, that sounds useful, right? Because if we, again, if we go back, it's a uh, expected identifier. So it's trying to parse an identifier and failing. So I was like, okay, well maybe what we're looking for is in this parse ident function. Um, and that's also obviously just a wrapper around parse ident common. So we go in there and oh, what's this? We've got a expected ident found, which is exactly the error message that we were getting. I was like, this is great. This is exactly what I find. So let's go inside, apply my advanced debugging techniques again, put a little println, and boom, there we go. I have run, um, I have run my test file, uh, which shows the error with a little debug print, and I get the output. I'm like, great, I'm in the right place. Now I need to figure out what changes to make. Um, and so this is sort of the generic flow of what we're gonna do. Um, if the current token we're looking at, so again, the compilers operate in tokens. We've got a token, which is a, a less than sign. If the current thing we're looking at is less than sign, it might be a generic, right? It might not be. What are the right less than question mark? That's not a generic, that's not a valid generic. So um, if we're in the right place and it's a valid generic, we'll show a suggestion. And there's a few edge cases there, right? So what if we're function less than question mark? What should we do there? In, this, in that case, the answer is, well, nothing. We'll just go back to the original error message and say, please give me an identifier. Um, if there are multiple generics, what happens if they go function uh, generic t, uh, my function generic x, which generic do we take? It's sort of really hard to answer that question, right? So we just don't. We just say, I expect an identifier, please give us the right thing. So this sort of fix that I did was only for a very, very specific case because trying to do it for everything is really hard, right? If they give us two valid generics, we possibly can't tell which one is more accurate unless we go way down the compiler and try maybe run both and see which one's gonna be more useful. Um, I wouldn't even know where to start with that. So that's what I did. Um, I wrote a bunch of code. I initially put a code in the screenshot, but I wasn't sure how Zoomy would work. Um, if you're interested, you can go and look, but it literally was just a bunch of ifs and else. Um, the hardest part of the PR was finding where to take the changes. The second hardest part was figuring out what methods to call, right? How do you actually emit uh, something like this? Um, and the answer is there is a function, um, Rust C like multi part suggestion. And so the first part of the suggestion is remove this negative T. And the second part is add this T. Um, and you can then make it generic across every single time you come across a struct or a function. So the, basically it was a bunch of ifs, else, making sure I was in the right place. Um, but the code itself was not that complicated. It was like 15 lines of code. Um, and there you go. Um, a bunch of stuff not pictured along the way. Learning how to do logging. Um, I tried console, I, pr uh, I tried a println, it didn't work, and I was like, what's going on? Then there's a whole chapter in the, the Rust dev book about logging, so I was like, okay, let's figure out how that works. Like I said, figuring out how to do emit a suggestion. Um, conversions between tokens and sort of strings. So for example, um, I only want this error to emit if we're in front of a function or a struct or a type, um, not some other token that might be there. Um, so checking we're in the right place was, it was a bit tricky than I thought, but I didn't know how to look ahead. And I found out there's a look ahead method. So I was like, great, we'll use that. Um, writing tests, writing tests in Rust C are really, really fun actually. Um, they're really nice and simple. I just copied one that already existed and changed a few things. Um, and they're all automated. You just write like the error code and then you run your test against your, your new code and it will produce the suggestion and leave that as a test for any future Rust releases. Um, they've got a thing called X. X is sort of the, the built-in tool for Rust C where you can X format, X test, X tidy. Um, and sometimes that takes a lot of time, especially the tests when you're running all the tests in Rust C and my little computer makes sure it doesn't burn. Um, that was that was tricky. I think it was a pretty, I think it's like eight gig of RAM or 16 it requires for you to do all that. Um, that was that was annoying sometimes. Um, but the, I think the thing that was most surprising to me is just time. Like often I would be like, hey, I've done up to this. I don't really know how to emit a suggestion. Any ideas? You wait a week, you wait two weeks, <laughs> you wait a month, <laughs> you ping them again. It's like, hey, just, just bumping this. It's like, oh, sorry, yeah, let me just here, here, go look at this, this link here for this documentation. They're like, oh, great. And I fixed the PR in like, you know, a few minutes because um, it's pretty chill. But yeah. Now it's your turn. So go find something, go find something, whether it be you know, a diagnostic or something else that you think is useful or relevant or something you wanna see changed and, and do that, right? It's a lot of the stuff I did didn't actually involve any knowledge of how the compiler worked. 
Um, a lot of it was ifs, else, and like self.token equals left bracket. <laughs> that's it. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I had. Uh, there is no question slide. I thought there was. Pretend there's a questions there. There's no time for questions. <laughs> 10 minutes on the dot. <laughs> hey. So Yeah, yeah. So there are a bunch of label. There are a bunch of issues that are labeled and reserved for like mentoring or easy. So sometimes you know the you know the people who work on Rust full time. They're like you know giga chads in there, um, you know putting through mega PRs a day. They just leave those alone. And it's like oh you want to try? Yeah, have this have this little small one, and they'll mentor you through it, etc. There is a channel on um, Zulip. Zulip, you don't use it. It's like. IRC, Discord, Slack, some chat platform that Rust devs use. Rust AU awesome, awesome. Ah, perfect. There's a on the Rust AU awesome. Um, there's a thing. Sorry, the question there was about you know Zulip and uh, Easy and Mentor stuff. So you can filter on GitHub by like, labels. So you can look for easy ones, or you can look for diagnostics. You can look for mentored ones. If you go on Zulip and say, hey, I want to give something a try. Some people just go through. I had somebody email me. I so I asked on the initial issue, be like, is this something that's going to be easy to do? Nobody replied, and I was like, I'll do it. And then somebody emailed me saying, hey, that one's too hard. Look at this one instead. And I was like, oh, cool. Let's see how I go. Um, so how do you get the maintainers' attention? You ping them. <laughs> so for me, what happens is when you make a PR. Bores, the bot that manages the Rust Lang yeah, sort of repositories, um, it will ping a team relevant to what files you changed. Um, if you're like if you're looking to it turn into a problem, right? What will happen is you can go on Zulip and you can say, "Hey, I'm looking at this issue. I've made a PR yet. Can somebody please direct me where to where to ask help?" For me, though, the compilers team. There's a compilers help channel in Zulip, and I can be like, "Hi, I don't know how to you know how do I start finding where to, where to look at so for the code change." Yeah, yeah. On, on the reviews, yeah, you can do that. And I think also on the issues, you can ping like a whole team. Be like, hi, someone help me, please. Um, I would recommend asking the Zulip first before you ping like the core maintainers. Um, but you know, it's it's everyone's pretty friendly. Just you have to be very patient. Like sometimes they'll take a month to reply, and that's just the reality of open source software. Um, and I was not used to it, given you know working here all the time. When it's like, oh, you ping someone, and within a day or two, they look at it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? How did I get into Rust? <laughs> um, basically, somebody begged me to learn <laughs> Rust. Um, for I, I did a lot of web dev beforehand, um, and in that exploration, I did a lot of Haskell, and I looked at Elm, which is like a Haskell-esque front-end library for web dev. Um, and the framework U, at the time of learning it, um, was very, very, very derived from Elm and Haskell, etc. And so one of my friends at the back was working on um, a Rust tool and wanted a front end for it and was like, hey, you know Elm, this is similar to Elm, you want to learn it? And at first I was like, no, leave me alone, I like JavaScript. Um, <laughs> didn't last very long. I spent one, I think I spent like a night just like being, oh, let me just have a look and see how hard it is. And I had like a little pink background and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, and I haven't been able to leave since. Um, and yeah, then we helped, you know, create and run and design a course for USW, which probably is a separate talk on its own, but. Any other questions in general? Yeah. Like, I shuttered a keep of power over like longer than a week. Like, how did you go over months? Was there any like issues with like changes to Rust as you can have it? Uh, it was actually fine. Like, I had to do one big rebase at the end because they moved the entire test folder to a new to a new directory. <laughs> um, but there was no conflicts or anything at all, which was surprising to me. I had a few test failures um, because I'm a dummy and forgot to format my code before I pushed. Um, but yeah, it was actually pretty chill. Surprisingly, I was like scared. I was like, "Oh no, am I got like a huge rebase with like all these things." But I think it's just the reason I got engaged. So the question is like, do I have a favorite PR that got me sort of engaged in this? I think particularly, it wasn't really me seeing other PRs that got me engaged. It was the fact that I'd seen all my students struggle to write Rust code. And it's like, oh, there's, you know, even though we could do some like nice, nicer ways to do this, but I never really had the, I never could figure out a concrete uh, suggestion of like, okay, this is a very common recurring case. I'm going to fix this common recurring case. So I just kept browsing the issues. And I kept browsing the issues, and eventually I saw that one. I was like, that is something that I've seen someone struggle with before. Thanks for reminding me that I want to try and fix that. Um, and there was a few other small ones as well. There was one where it's like, oh, if you put this space before this identifier in this directory, it will always break. 
And some of those are like simple one-line fixes, some of them are a bit more complicated. Um, but usually if you, if you ask on an issue, say, hey, is this friendly for new people? They'll say, yeah, go for it, or like, no, run away. Like, this will take you a long time. Um, and it, they'll say, run away, but also there's this one open, which you want to look at. Um, you can also, sometimes issues are claimed. You can sort of ignore that sometimes, um, because people claimed it like six months ago, then never really did anything. So you can just bump it, like, hey, is this being worked on still? Can I steal this? There, there is. Who, as in, who can be a mentor? Who can? So the, uh, the question was: Is there a mentorship program? Um, I don't know. If there's a formal one, but a lot of some of the issues in Rusty are tagged as like mentor available. Also on Zulip, if you ask, just ask them. Hey, are there any good mentor ones? They'll provide you a list. Um, hey, yeah. awesome. Fifteen minutes on the dot. So. <laughs>